Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of CRE Exchange. I'm Cole Perry, your host and senior market analyst here at Altus Group, a leading provider of asset and fund level intelligence. I'm joined by Omar Elsrai, our U.S. Director of Research. Today, we're also pleased to have a guest with us, Adriana de Alcantara from Heinz U.S. Property Partners. Omar and Adriana, it's great to be with you guys. Glad to be here. Adriana, welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. I'm super excited to have you on, not only because of your impressive track record as an investor and fund manager, but also because every time that we speak, you really leave me more excited about the CRE industry than I was coming into the conversation. So before we dive into the markets, Heinz, your fund, and the CRE industry at large, I'd like to take a moment to really let the listeners learn a bit more about you. So in addition to your notable professional CV and accomplishments, you're fluent in five languages, an avid runner, a mother. Each of these is quite impressive alone, but is even more so taken all together and collectively. So what else would you be willing to share about yourself with the listeners? Thank you, Omar. First of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm super happy to be here. Actually, my profile is a little more different than most, right? I was born in Brazil. With my family, we traveled a lot. When I was 16 years old, we went to Germany. We lived there for one year. And from there, with my parents, we went to Spain. I did college in Spain. What is interesting is my dad, at a very young age in Brazil, he is an engineer by trade. He just used valuation of single family homes in Brazil. But that was his second job. It was his second job because he was working for a multinational, a German multinational. That's why we went to Germany. But by then, in Brazil, I find it interesting, they were speaking about inflation in the U.S. Inflation was high in Brazil. Even though he had a very good job, he needed to have a second job, unfortunately, even though we were in a good position, right? Anyways, I used to go with my dad at a very young age to do these valuations of the single family homes. And still today, I love real estate. I love going to the property, seeing them. And beyond that, obviously, as you said, I have three kids. I have three daughters. I started my life early. I have one that is 31, one that is 28, and my little one that is 18. And I live in Miami and I work in New York. Fantastic. And I guess each of these sound quite exhausting, but you have amazing energy and drive. What would you say keeps you motivated and keeps you excited each day? Wow, so many things, Omar, but just yesterday, one of my daughters, she sent me a quote, her iPhone sends her an inspiring quote every day. And it was saying that you are a strong woman because you have been raised by a strong woman. So really being a role model for my kids, for my daughters, and just for young money in the industry, that keeps me going. We have a few a lot to do. Adriana, you talked a little bit about this, but how do you think that kind of international exposure has shaped your perspective and your career? To start, I travel a lot and sometimes I feel fake even in my home country, Brazil, right? I have been all over the place. But what it gives you, it gives you resilience. It's not easy. And the ability to cope with difficult situations. Plus, you really have a global experience. I have a global experience. I know how European markets work. I know how the American markets, they work, right? What I find interesting, I love Europe. Every time that I go to Germany, as an example, I feel at home. I like the German culture. I understand the culture. But I do think the U.S., in terms of real estate and the economy, has so many advantages. First of all, it's one single market. I mean, a lot of people that love spending money, right? One language. And the last part that I find it interesting in Europe, we build single family homes to last for the next probably 100 years. That doesn't happen here. Last. They don't last for 100 years of properties. But that means that the economy here in the U.S., it's very dynamic, always moving. I think that it is a real advantage for the U.S., in addition to multiple countries, you've seen various companies at various different stages. One aspect of your experience that jumped out to me was while you were at Nuveen, when it was acquired by TIA in 2014. Can you speak to your role with regards to the integration of those platforms? And is there any lessons that you took away from that or challenges that you faced and overcome? First of all, let me tell you that I was really very fortunate. I, through my career, I had really very good mentors. and. People that helped me really over the years, specifically when we did a TI acquired a V and TI acquired as well Henderson in the UK. But I was one of, in the US, the team wanted to expand the third party business. 
because I was working before TIA and O'Connor Cabinet Partners, party management, we had one of the largest real estate funds, calls and funds in the market, called sponsored by JP Morgan. I was one of the few people that had experience in third party. So TIA said we to New York. So that was one point. And then lessons learned, I think three things. Number one, your biggest asset is your people. I started at TIA just after Lehman bankruptcy. I was working at Lehman as T1 till the end. And I joined two colleagues. We were three starting the first office of TIA outside the US in London. And even by that time, Lehman Brothers bankruptcy was really very hard to hire people. So read your biggest assets are people. If you find the right people that you trust, take care of them. Take care of them. All in life is a choice, right? You have to be selective, but go the extra mile to take care of them. I think this is very important. The second piece is consistency. And it's the same concept that the compounding NOI. I find it, I know that I'm a you know, real estate nerd. I compare everything in my life to properties. Just doing something every day is so important. It makes a difference. And the last one and third, final point is renovation. Real estate is the same all over the places, but people will remember you the way you did business with them, right? That is the most important. Your reputation is the most important thing in your career. Yeah, definitely. And so after you were at Nuveen, you were actually at Heinz. You joined in January of 2020, which early stages of the pandemic, a new role is difficult for many different reasons, but I can't imagine what that was like. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Kind of what you learned from that experience and where you're at? Perfect market timer, right? Such a good market timer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I stayed at TI and yeah, I have been, I stayed there for 11 years. Very good company, but I always really thought very highly of Heinz. Very smart people, humble people, really very quality, really safe. And when I got the call and by then my boss is Alfonso Mok, the CIO of the Americas, he called me, he asked me, hey, do you want to join us? We're launching the third party business, uh, the investment management business here in the US. And we would love you to come to launch our open and core plus fund. I have to say that it was really difficult to resist. Joining, starting from scratch, an open end fund. And I had already the experience at Nuveen starting an open end fund, but starting now with a company, we have over 3,000 people in the US. That makes a difference, right? And even obviously, I was one of the, the last people that Heinz hired just prior to the pandemic. Do you get concerned? Yes, you get concerned. But Heinz is a wonderful company, it's a special place. I always found welcome. I always found secure. I always found that I could make the difference. I, I would say fund management as well as CRE tend to be a little bit more male dominated. And yet here you are. What would you say has been your experience as a, or has there been anything that is notable about being a female fund manager in an otherwise largely male dominated space? Is that something that, do you think that there is any kind of like notable difference between your experience? Oh, definitely. I do think that I did have to work twice as men to get recognized. Let me tell you that. I think it is changing. It is getting better. But I always try to see challenges on the positive side. I always actually took advantage of the fact that being the only woman at the table, people remember you, right? Even today in my work, I work with really very good women. I hire a very talented women. And I don't hire them because they are women. I hire them because they are good. In my job as a fund manager, on a constant basis, I need to take decisions. And I want and I like to have different opinions from different people. That makes my job so much more valuable, I think. And I'm able to take the right decisions because I hear these different opinions. The diversity of perspectives coming together to form yeah. essentially better outcomes because you've considered it from more angles. I like that. Yeah. I must admit, I'm a complete workaholic. Okay. But I don't think of that as negatives. Actually, real estate is my job, but it's as well my hobby, it's my passion. So I like going to see real estate in the weekends, but I had to work twice. Let me tell you that. 
I know Omar and I are the same way, thinking about that as our hobby and our job. But Adriana, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and you say your diversity of perspectives, I think one kind of range of diverse perspectives comes from age. Do you have any advice maybe for young folks starting their careers in CRE or particularly young women starting in CRE? Sure. Network as much as you can, right? Don't be afraid of asking questions or getting someone to mentor, advise you, right? And then work. Be consistent. Be consistent. There's not a big secret. Hard work is a big secret. So shifting a little bit towards the current market environment, you've been able to see significant amount of change through various phases of market cycle during your career, both at industry level through the GFC, as well as the pandemic, mm -hmm. as well as company specific change. For example, with your time at Nuveen and TIA, or also launching your fund at Heinz. With all of that, you've gained some pretty rare and I would say very valuable perspective. At the highest level, how would you characterize today's market environment and how does it compare to other periods that you've seen and gone through? Look, today I think we are in a transition period and we're going to see there's a light on the tunnel, right? But beyond interest rates going up, inflation, I do think that the most important, the significant difference between now and several other cycles is the advancement in technology, innovation, sustainability. I think the last five years we went so fast and it's so fascinating. Every time that I hear people talking about, there's many top techs companies out there. We are uh, ourselves launching a venture fund to invest in top tech. It's so fascinating to see AI, artificial intelligence, how it's going to define and make a difference even in our industry than in real estate industry. How much of that, I would say, tech narrative, is it hype? Is it hopeful? Is it very real and something that we'll be able to see the returns really come back to investors in the near term? How would you characterize that tech component and the, I would say, the optimism around that? Well, obviously there is a hype. Always like this. I remember back in 2000, by then Google, Amazon, they were smaller companies investing in San Francisco, right? But look at that today. They are so large. They are not small companies anymore. Obviously there is a hype, but I think the advancements that we have today, maybe as it relates as well, not only real estate, but healthcare. That is really going to improve the lives for so many people. I think it's going to be fascinating. Good yeah. thing for still young to see it. If you think about improved healthcare equals longer lives, which ultimately that has huge ramifications for not just real estate, but just the economy as a whole, right? If we're already, we're living well beyond the, when social security was initially constructed, we were not expected to live that much longer after, and it's changed the states and I would say the national finances, but also how the American consumer lives is huge. Yeah. I would just echo that. I think that's a fascinating space. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Now, Adriana, how do you think that the current market, this transition period that we're in, how do you think that differs from either the uh, GFC or some other periods of market disruption? And I think maybe adding on to that, do you, with your sort of international experience, do you suppose that this is similar to things you've witnessed in other geographies in other parts of the world? Starting by the last question, as I mentioned before, I told from an emerging market, I know how hard inflation is. I actually think the Fed is doing it right a good job. Inflation is moderating. If not, growth is really takes a long time to get back to growth. I think that the current period is much more akin to the 1970s and 80s, where we had really higher interest rates and higher inflation. But today, what I think it's really very different, once again, is technological advancement as well, but the interconnection and social media. Everyone is online all the time. Even my parents, they buy online in Amazon groceries, right? really happen. COVID magnified that for sure. Shifting attention towards Heinz with a near seven decade track record, close to a hundred billion in AUM. Heinz is, I would say, well known and well respected in the CRE industry. But what would you say are some of its differentiating characteristics as a firm? First of all, we are family business. We are in a business for over three generations now. We had 90, as you're saying, 95 billion of assets under management, and we have over 3,000 people in the U.S. alone. We have 5,000 people across the world. But what is interesting here is that every time that I travel in the U.S., 
I go to an office that we have. We have an exposure in 91 cities in the U.S. And that is really, I run an open and diversified fund. To me, that was so important. And where we are disengaged is that we are fully integrated. We do everything in-house, from facility management, to property management, to asset management. And really what that means is that we know the tenants, we know the trends in the market. And at the end of the day, it means access to pipeline. We have all these pieces of people across the U.S. that at any point in time, Omar and go, we can't be working in a property in Miami, another one in New York, another one in Chicago, all at the same time. I don't think many people can say that. I can see that as a very strong competitive advantage. What are those communication channels like internally? Do you have to reach out to a completely different team to, to get that the info from what the property management team's seen or... Is it something that is more open and flowing? Because everything is in the house, we control so much better the assets. I'll give you an example for our multifamily assets. We do have our own property manager in-house. It's a Heinz brand. It's called Willowick. It's my properties. I don't know. If I want to increase the occupancy or if I want to do more marketing in my properties, I can literally call the people, the internal people, and tell them, hey, I, I want to spend $10,000 more in marketing. Obviously, I have a fully dedicated team helping me. Let me tell you that. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without my dedicated team. But no, it's very fluid. We're constant in communication and on a weekly basis. We have a pipeline call with all the team included in this pipeline call. It's pretty powerful. Zooming in a little bit, do you mind telling us a little bit about Heinz U.S. Property Partners, your fund? Do you want to give us a little bit of history and maybe yeah. give us an overview there? History. So I joined Heinz in January 2020. Once again, great timing, right? I had no clients. I had no funds. I had no team. It was really very hard to put all together through COVID, but that makes me even more proud. We launched the fund in July 2021. We went out to the market, obviously, a lot of zoos. I did travel. We did to some I would say five due diligence on site. And that's the good part of clients. We have local people as well, right? But in any case, we launched the fund in July 2021. We launched with an initial one point five billion on equity commitments, growing beyond due diligence with several other clients right now. And we started investing. The fund is still very small. It's a core plus fund. It's our flagship fund. We invest in core properties. We invest in value add properties. Portfolio is small. We have one billion of assets under management, very diversified, 15 assets. Starting the fund in July 2021, if you remember, that time the market was already very volatile. Obviously, it was doing, I think it was doing 20, uh, over 20%, the open end index in the US. So we took two decisions. Number one, diversify the fund as much as you can in the event of market going south, which it did. And the second piece, patient department. Going into 2023, we had only 40% deployment. What that means is that we have 1.5 billion to invest in this market. So you've now had two years of the ability to implement changes. And I want to hear a little bit about what have you already brought since you started it? And what are you planning to implement or are currently implementing as far as changes go? We're in a much different environment than we were in July of 2021. So I want to know kind of your thoughts on what those changes might be. Okay. In terms of strategy, we did not change. Our high conviction sectors, being the living sector, the industrial sector, alternatives. And by alternatives, I mean data centers, healthcare, medical office and life science, and cell storage. It is an open end forever fund. So we have a long term strategy. So that did not change. Obviously, the market thing I was, was saying was it is a transition period. Right now, the last 12 months, we didn't really acquire multifamily because there's still a big spread between me and us. For multifamily, we haven't seen many properties below a 6%. Yeah. We think there's some repricing there. We haven't been We haven't acquired any because we're not made to see the price. But cash is king right now. There's a lot of redemptions for every single open end funds. Obviously, we're going to take advantage of it. That has been the big shift, I think. It's going to be a very good vintage. 
One thing that I came across in your fund literature is that you are targeting to invest in next generation assets. What do you mean by next generation assets and how does that fit into the industrial living sectors and alternatives that you mentioned? Yeah, sure. Buy yield and manage the core. So we buy core properties that we can at manage. We buy bandwidth properties, properties that we can manage to core. And then we do developments built to core, right? And the best way that I can explain to you how what is exactly a next generation answer is through some pictures. I have three developments on the fund right now. I have one that is called Clark Park multifamily development. One that is 22 Pratt, another multifamily development in Boston, and an industrial development in, in Boston as well. So the first one, Clary Park, this is a multifamily development, 45 minutes south of Nashfield in a big employment hub in the middle of two Amazon fulfillment centers. As you can see on the map, there's a Nissan plant, there are hospitals there. So employment, very important. And the pictures that you're seeing here, these are renderings. This is a master plan community. Hines, we have been developed, uh, we have been managing this master plan community for a long time. And the fund being an open end fund, we have, we had the opportunity to access the multifamily. So we are building here, what you're seeing here in the picture. So this garden on the right, the big picture, that's a Zen garden. We call it a Zen garden. So people can do yoga there. So a lot of amenities, the whole area is a master plan community. So there are retail pods that are signing to retailers. One of the retailers is going to be In-N-Out Burger, as an example, the first In-N-Out Burger in the East Coast. So a lot of retail, it's over 112 shops. So leave, work, and play. That is the idea of, in this case, placemaking. That's the next generation asset. The next one is 22 Pratt. This is a multifamily development as well. It's 15 minutes, as you can see in the map, from Harvard University. It is as well 15 minutes from the Boston University, adjacent to the Harvard Beach Research Project development that they have going on right now. But what is super interesting here is that we are looking to build mass timber, this multifamily. So really an innovation in the space. And the last one, that's an industrial development in Boston as well. That is, as you can see in the map, is two miles away from the most Boston Logan Airport. I remember going the first time there on site and you can't see the airport from the side. We started construction, we are going to complete it by mid-2024, going to be state-of-the-art building. So that's next generation assets for us. The buy, build, manage decor, that's really how you fill out the core plus strategy mandate. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a very dynamic portfolio. We have a seed that is development. We start building, as an example, these are all ongoing developments. And once we have this industrial finish completed by mid 2024 and least, then it turns core and then we go to the next development and so forth. Fantastic. And each of these assets seems quite diverse in the sense that some of these are mixed use. But I know that diversification is a major theme that you've brought up a number of times. Are there any additional benefits that you would like to call attention to with regards to why you're implementing and so focused on bringing diversification to the portfolio? Sure. Risk mitigation is the most important one. And this is an open end fund. So when you're starting the fund, you have no idea if the market is going to go south or is it going to be a great market, right? So diversify. The first one being is so important. Diversify as much as you can. That is the most important piece. And then the second piece is we are within an illiquid asset class, but we are still in a, we have an open end fund. Try to make it as liquid as possible. If you have 15 assets, on average, I have every asset is $70 million. It's so much easier to, number one, sell assets that are $70 million than $300 million. And second, you are also joint valuation from $300 million assets right now. How difficult is it? 50 million, 70 million, you have many more trades in the market. You can compare that. I do valuations on a quarterly basis. We do valuations on a quarterly basis. So that was really important for us. 
And Adriana, how are you guys identifying your top performing markets? How are you measuring these? We talk a little bit about diversity or diversification, either whether that's MSAs or property types. How are you guys identifying and, and measuring those top performing markets? That is a great question. Uh, you have a very good research team, local team. They are actually in Boston. Most of the team is in Boston. But anyways, we screen over 4,000 sub-markets in the U.S. to come around 20 to 20 to get to investable markets. So that is really very powerful to us. How is the markets? And turning outward a little bit, how have you seen this kind of diversification or entering new markets? How have you seen that been playing out with kind of other folks in across CRE? Wow, that's a very difficult question. You're putting me <laughs> on the spot there. Obviously, I'm biased, but I do think that we have a very good model. I think we have the right model to invest in real estate. Other companies have other models. The difference, I think, here is what I told you before. At any point in time, I can be working in Miami on, a, on an investment, Chicago, San Diego, San Francisco, San Francisco is probably a bad example, right? But anyways, we can work through cycles in every work. That is the main difference, even as it relates to research. Now, looking a little bit more ahead to 2024, or we can look at this in the just next 12 months, what do you see as your main priorities? And do you see any market catalysts that you have on your radar or at least are keeping an eye on? Look, I think I'm a big believer on case making, mixed use. So I think the industry is going towards that. We have, as an example, I was mentioning Clary Park. It takes you a long time to manage these master plans. So the team Clary Park, they have been working on different entitlements for the last five years, right? But once you have it, People, it's so nice. There's suburban areas where you can work there, you can live there, you can have fun there. That really makes the difference. That's number one. The second point, obviously, the office sector, as we all know, is very difficult. I do not know what is going to happen, but what I do know is that it feels to me it is very similar to a retail sector for 10 years ago. Everyone is working, talking about work from home. But the reality is that it just magnified the problem. The problem is that right now, the, the capital structures are upside down. We build too much, too many offices in this country. So you need to get through this oversupply or under demolished office sector. And digging into that a little bit deeper and maybe making this a kind of a binary question, do you see more opportunity or more risk with office? Good question. I would say... Right now, for the fund, let me start by saying that we are not buying office for the foreseeable future because it's very difficult to see where it is going to go. But all this said, I do think that there is opportunity. And the reason for that is that not all office is bad office, right? Number one, we are co-developers of a week's better build. That is really fantastic. We have over almost 100% occupancy and highest rents. That is one point. And the second point, because there is there are so many redemptions on the open end funds in the US, you are talking about around the art. Do you think percent of redemptions is 36 billion? I think this number is better than me, but around 36 billion in redemptions. That's a big number. And what is happening is that not only the open end funds, they are not investing in your properties, but they are investing capital in their current properties. And they're becoming even more obsolete. And what that means, if you are able to reach the next generation, invest in the next generation office, I think it's going to be an opportunity. Absolutely. Beyond 2024, how do you see the industry changing in the next maybe three to five years? As I told you before, technology is fascinating. I think we are going to see a much more service-oriented industry. We are seeing already, but it's going to be magnified. That's number one. And number two, mixed use concepts, which is, by the way, you look at Europe, has always been this way, right? Lower density buildings. You go to London, London is packed. You go to Madrid, Madrid is packed. It's so nice uh, to see this. The cities, they are really mixed use cities. Do you see sustainability playing into that at all? Definitely, yes. It's very important. But when I think about sustainability, I think about performance as well. If our buildings, they are more energy efficient, that will relate in rent premiums. There are many studies out there that you can get higher rents for greener buildings. And that should translate as well in value for our investors, right? 
So that's how I think about sustainability. Europe is in advance on that. We're a little behind, but this is coming. Even in terms of regulation, our fund, our open-end fund is classified as an Article 8 fund under the European regulation. And what that means is by no means a green fund, okay? But what that means is that we are promoting sustainability. And it's nothing more than what we're already doing, collecting data and contributing to a benchmark, including repauses in your leases. So we're doing all this, but there's going to become more regulation in the U.S. for sure on the topic. So in the last couple of minutes we have you here, we like to ask the same question to all of our guests. And I think you might've already touched on some of your answers here, but if you could snap your fingers and have one change come to the industry, what would it be? One change coming to the industry. And so we're saying once again, what makes his concepts. All right. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. 